actually they should all go hand in hand. But just for simplicity's sake, we say you create fit for purpose assets and then you make media choices, right? So what we'll do now is get into a framework which helps you do this. And again, we are simplifying life like tremendously. This is not how simple life is, but uh, we'll try and do that uh, so that you get a flavor. Recording in progress. Questions to ask. Can we just dim the lights on this side if that's possible? Or is it readable to all of you? I know the text is not uh, too readable. OK, so if you can, that's great. So what we're saying is that if you start with the customer in mind, that's how all marketing programs should start. I can typically just segment my entire customer base into two kinds of people. There are people who are interested or warm to the brand or to the message, right? And then there are people who have no interest, right? So given that I've come from HP, let's think of PCs as a category. Uh, your PCs, uh, let's say, conged off, right? Happens all the time, once in a while. And you're suddenly very interested in the category, right? Or you're seeking admission. And you know that, hey, I'm going to use a PC for the next three, four years. It's going to be a great tool for me. And therefore, you're very interested uh, you know, in the category suddenly. Or you're just warm to the brand or to the message, right? So generally, whenever there's a new Nike ad release, all marketers get excited, right? And we go and check it out, although I have no intention of buying shoes, right? But I'm just warm to the brand, and I love the brand, and therefore I go check it out, right? Uh, I hope some of you do that when HP ads come out, right? But that's OK. So then there is disinterest, right? I'm not going to buy table fans probably in the next five years. I have therefore no interest in the category. Whatever a table fan man manufacturer says, I will just wait for the ad to kind of pass through, right? I have no interest in, let's say, for argument's sake, a brand like Apple, right? And therefore, whatever Apple says, I'm going to just ignore, right? So just these two kind of people. And then from the brand side, there are two kind of messages. There's an explicit message which focuses on communicating a very specific message. Bad example is 10% off, yeah? You know, 30% bigger. My sale starts on 9 July. Very specific messages, right? And then there are implicit messages. Examples of an implicit message, anybody? Even before I tell you the concept? What could an implicit message sound like? Let's stay with the brand Nike. Yep, Tanisha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what could be the message? Uh, so in case of Nike, if I'm looking Just at do it. it. Yeah, that's a great implicit message. Yes, thanks, thanks, Roshan. Yeah, so just do it. Something implicit, right? There's the implicity of take action, right? Or uh, there is uh, any other brand uh, implicit message combination? Yes? Uh, McDonald's, I'm loving it. McDonald's, I'm loving it. Right, solid example, yeah? So you guys get it, right? So implicit message focuses on building or reinforcing an association with the brand, right? Nike wants to associate itself with the idea of athleticism, action, right? McDonald's wants to associate themselves with the idea of happiness, happy family time, right? Taste a great happy meal, yes please. Could or could be, could not be, right? So a tagline is a, a, like an asset which is customer facing. But just think of the messaging for now, right? So as a brand, you might have a lot more than the tagline to communicate, right? So yes, please. Um, would you say explicit messaging is mostly, um, it's better to go for people who are like more warm towards your brand so and So that's my next slide, yeah? So interested, warm, and I'll just come to that question, Arushi. So where are you likely to find interested people in your category, right? Browsers of e-com. You opened Amazon, and you typed in laptop, or you typed in gaming laptop, right? You're interested in the category, and that's why you've already done it. And then there are lots of other people, people walking right in the campus today who are pro probably disinterested or you know, have low interest in my category. At least that's what I understand from uh, where they are today. Coming to Arushi's question, now there are two kinds of, uh, uh, you know, or let's say explicit messages. What are they? 
let's just get into that. I think there was a question, right? Is, is it a tagline, right? So category specific differentiators which drive purchase intent. Make sense? A bit of jargon here, but category specific. It has to be specific to the category, right? So if you have a message saying, as an air conditioner, uh, I can cool your room 30% faster, right? Category specific. And it should drive purchase intent, right? It should make me want to buy you. That's a category specific explicit message. And then there are brand specific attributes, right? And these build meaningfulness. Again, a bit jargonish, but uh, basically, you know, we talked about this idea of Nike and athleticism, right? And there might be many other ways of saying just do it or associating with the idea, but uh, you get it. Uh, so Nike, for example, wants an attribute is basically something which the brand wants to stand for in the customer's mind, right? As simply as that. So when they want to stand for you know, perseverance, right? They might have a separate message. They want to stand for uh, inclusiveness. Then they might have a message and so on, okay? So you guys get the idea of just bringing it together now. Why we were kind of understanding those eight elements is because every combination of these two results in a marketing job to be done, yeah? So very simply put, if I know somebody is interested or warm to the category or to the brand, and I have an implicit message to tell, my job is to continue reinforcing what I do as a brand, right? If there is somebody who's not interested in my brand or in the category, and I have an explicit message to say, then I have to do it with impact, right? Because the guy's anyway not interested, right? Why will she care about what, uh, like, uh, you know, Nike does or ceiling fans do or air conditioners do, right? You, so just to maybe an example will help uh, you know make this point. So the quiz is coming right after this one, okay? So uh, when I have to do impact, or when should I do impact? I should do impact <coughs> with disinterested customers when I have an explicit message, but I have a new news. Right. Launching India's first made in India television. New news, right? Launching the iPhone 15 Pro, right? Available at a store near you tomorrow. Explicit message, but I have to do it with impact, right? Because I have new news, right? Or there's a really a, like a main point uh, which I have to drive. Now, reinforce existing brands when they, and what you call brand building, right? You must have heard this term, oh, we need to build our brands, make it stronger. When you have to reinforce an existing attribute of the brand, uh, whom do you do it with? Implicit people, but interested in the uh, category or the brand. If they're not interested, your message will just fly by, right? So you keep showing, let's say, you know, somebody's out there, again, to buy PCs. You keep telling them, hey, HP stands for innovation. HP stands for amazing engineering experiences. I know that you're in the market to buy. Oh, I can move this? Okay, great. Sure, got it. Yeah, just moving now, okay. So we were saying, uh, so light touch reminders help, right? When you're trying to reinforce, but you have to do it with people who are interested, right? And what did we miss? There is activate. You know, a very important part of marketing, which actually we do a lot more of, and we should do a less, le lot less of, but people interested in the category, because today digital marketing allows you to capture signals and understand who are the people in the category, you try to activate them, right? Whether you have a call to action, buy me now, I'm on an offer, right? Or clear and sale, bad example, but right, explicit message to somebody who's interested in the category. Make sense? Yeah, so a lot of nods, so I guess you guys are with me. Yes, please. Yeah, I was interested in the comment you made that, that you should. Yeah, I can hear you. Go on. That you should do a lot less of uh, activation and like, like people say. Yeah, no, good question. So, see, sometimes what happens is, I'll just answer that, Sunny, I'll come to you. So, 
what happens is that because there's a lot of measurement today available on Activate, you end up over investing in that. Also, there's a short term result available, right? Plus, sometimes you're just plain insecure. You feel that, oh my God, I've got this customer who's searching HP laptops. Now, if somebody else comes and advertises to this customer, I'm likely to lose her. Doesn't happen most of the time, but then you're just insecure sometimes and you say, hey, let me, I've got her till this point now, let me just capture her, right? So that's why over investment typically happens. What do you mean by that reinforcing association? Why, where does that come into play in the framework? Reinforcing implicit so, associations yeah. with, so customers is interested in the brand or the category, right? Uh, what you're trying to do is to continue to reinforce the same message with him because that's how memory structures are built. We said that, how do you learn? You learn anything by Reinforcement, you're told this again and again. You, you know, uh, like you read through, it, read through it again, post lectures, you read it before exams, that's how learning happens, right? So that's what it is. And then there's augmentation, right? And some good examples here, for, I'll let me just talk about this one. So <coughs> augmentation, so what do you do with all these people who are disinterested in the brand and the category, right? How do you get them? Take an implicit message. Tell her a story, yeah? And you're likely to get her to get interested. So you see all those long form films done by brands, that's what they're trying to do. You're not interested in the brand today, but they're not saying, hey, I have a pencil to sell. They say, I have a story to tell. Are you interested, right? So that's when you listen to them. Cool, so now let's get into the quiz. I'm going to show you some advertising, right? Uh, tell me which brand do you think it falls? <coughs> There's so much light. Uh, Brinda, is there a of This is going to be a good theater experience, right? I have a lot of long form <coughs> films to show you guys. Yeah, this is great. Breakups are always there, huh? You deserve better. Over oh, Ranch? You look like a shakal. Don't worry about it. What's your tissue paper? Huh? You used it as a use. You're wearing fidgets, right? You're wearing fidgets, you're wearing fidgets, you're wearing fidgets, there's no use. That's what he is. You're shaming him. Don't cry. Roar. Roar. Like, roar. Did it? Yes. It's not him. It's the laptop screen. Oh. So, you break up with the laptop. Try HP for vision. It's safe for eyes. Also, Alexa, what is the remedy for sore eyes? Lots of sleep and some cool cucumber over the eyes. Don't let your laptop make you cry. The all-new HP Pavilion with iSafe certified display. Now with 12th gen Intel Core processors and Alexa built-in. Yeah, what quadrant? Impact, reinforce, activate, augment. Yeah, Ananya? Okay, anybody else for augment? Okay, any different answers? Yes, please. Impact, anybody else for impact? Okay. Which was? Okay, let's look at this again, yeah? Yeah, yeah you said impact. Anybody else, any different answers? Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Somebody said augment, right? Just tell me a bit more, why did you think this was augment? Felt like an emotional story? Yeah, it felt more than that. Okay. Laptop, brightness come here, thoda khareed lo. Emotion ka hai isme? With the first half and more less focus on the last number. It was? It was Misleading you between so, augmentation and reinforce. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, which is what good act, reinforce advertising should do. It should make you feel that you're watching a story. Right, that's how you get engagement. Yeah. 
answer what sorry go on go on. i feel when they mean story the story should kind of connect the brand to something supposing there was a story about an athlete and then nike was doing an advertisement that made sense but if there's a story about a breakup and then that's connected to the laptop screen i think the story is just being added for humor and not the touch or not the connection so in that case augment yeah that's sense. a good way to put it so i'll tell you in my mind this is reinforce and see again guys marketing is a I like to believe it's a science, but it can at times be subjective, right? The same thing can actually be emotional for someone else with a different state of mind. I would like to believe that we were, what we were doing was reinforcing. And what we were trying to do was to, again, reinforce the idea of engineering experiences which amaze you, right? That's what we were trying to do. Cool. Let's go to the... What was the explicit message? True. They were some True. So uh, that's a good point. Uh, see, the, the way I would think of the message is that uh, it was uh, used as a ploy to build a brand attribute, right? See, and that's what happens. And it's a bit of a fine line, right? Because it's an engineering company eventually. What you're trying to build is an association about great engineering experiences. And therefore, it's used as a platform to do something else, right? I'm going to play one more, and then we'll come back. I'll come to you, yeah? Anisha, what oh, are you Carlos has joined the call. He will open the laptop, the password will be opened. I'm going to make coffee. Anisha, one cup of coffee for me. The all-new HP Pavilion and Intel Evo Design. Yeah, which quadrant? Yes, please. Um, so this, I, this I feel is impact and reinforce from from impact to reinforce. Let's try to just like castigate it in one. Impact. Impact. Okay. Because you thought there's new news. Um, yeah, specifically that new news, at least towards like you know the character, like the whole idea of like waking it up in one second is new. That surely is new to the, to the majority of customers out there. Got it. Got it. Cool. So then that brings us to a you know a, a, a good point on this one. See, the choice of media therefore is very important. Let me go back to this. See, impact. Whenever you're thinking of impact, think of what media is getting used. Because typically, impact needs engaging or interrupting conscious processing. So I would typically associate impact with the front of page Times of India, or with the biggest holding, an outdoor holding in the world, which is impossible to miss, or out of home. Impact needs impact media. So every time you have new news, don't make a video. First, take the single biggest holding in the city, and just paste it out there, right? Because you've got to conscious, you've got to interrupt conscious processing. The way media gets delivered today, a lot of <coughs> social films get delivered. They are basically getting delivered on a five-inch screen, right? So typically, even if you had impact messaging or main point, you might not be able to deliver it. Yeah. So I'm conscious of time. This is just supposed to be like the uh, uh, base this thing, I want to move to the Gen AI part quickly. I'll just do one or two more. What does this look like? Activate. A little bit of activate. Yeah, so this is purely activate. You, you've seen my video, you probably got interested because of those two girls. Hey, here's this uh, thing, you know, why don't you buy it now? Right? And what is this? This is the Times of India front page. Impact, okay. Anything else? I'd say reinforce. So I would say this is a bad example of a impact media, right? So what we did, so like the brand manager obviously tried to do everything. So he took the Times of India front page. He did not say, hey, launching the new Spectre with ABC. He just said, be the best you. By the way, you can buy it at 99.99. By the way, here's my table. And oh, by the way, I also have these three features, right? Singularity got lost. 
right? And therefore, it probably did nothing. Yeah. Uh, this one. This is a website banner. Activate. Activate. Okay. Yeah. Why? You have, an entire you have a call to action. You have an offer, right? But uh, are you interrupting conscious processing? Probably yes. I don't know, right? So again, I, for me, it's like somewhere on the border between impact and activate. Right, and it's okay to do that, right, once in a while, right. What do you think about this? This is an e commerce banner. E -commerce most likely activate, activate, got it, yes. This is all activate examples, okay. So now, just if you can dim the lights again, we are going to play a film. <coughs> Has everyone seen this film? No. Yes, मेरा नाम पुरेश चित्रकार और ये बापी है मेरा पोता हेलो स्कूल में छुट्टियां चल रही है ना इसलिए ये मेरे साथ ही आया है मैं ये वाला लूंगी अरे वाह इसकी कहानी बहुत बढ़िया है मछलियों की शादी के बारे में चलो चलो बहुत सामान बांधो और निकलो यहां से बाबूजी आप यहां दुकान नहीं लगा सकते तो फिर हम कहां जाएंगे मुझे नहीं पता यहां पर देखिए अलाउड नहीं भाई साहब दिवाली का वक्त है आप मैडम इनके दिवाली के चक्कर में हमको प्रॉब्लम हो जाएगा देखिए बाबूजी 5 मिनट में सामान बांधिए और निकलिए ठीक है सॉरी चलिए चलिए आप लोग चलो बेटा तो यार चलते हैं हम लोग इतनी दूर से यहाँ आते हैं, पर लगता है कि अब इस शहर में हमारे लिए कोई जगह नहीं बची। या ये लीजिए, पूरे रख लेना। उतने ही लेंगे, जितना बनता है। नमस्कार। मैम आप चाय लेंगे? No thanks. मैम मैं क्या सोच रहा था कि अगले हफ्ते दिवाली है मैम ये जो जगह है मैम इसकी साफ सफाई करते हैं ना मैम डेकोरेशन लाइट वगैरह डालते एकदम चकाचक हो जाएगा मैम ये डेकोरेशन यस मैम यहाँ पे ये यस मैम चकाचक चकाचक जागी जागी रोशनी दिल में कहीं जो थी छुपी जागी उम्मीदे नहीं मन में दिया जलने लगी जागी जागी एक रोशनी दिल में कहीं जो थी छुपी अंधेरे मिटा दो किसी के सपने सजा दो किसी के अंधेरे मिटा दो किसी के सपने सजा दो दिल में जगा बना लो अपनी दुनिया में बसा लो क्या कर दिया आपने? थोड़ी सी जगह बना दी। बस। किसी के अंधेरे मिटा दो किसी के सपने सजा दो दिल में जगह। इस दिवाली के अवसर पर हम पंद्रह बड़े शहरों में देश के कारीगरों के लिए HP World Stores में थोड़ी सी जगह बना रहे हैं। अपने करीबी HP World Store पे आइए और परेश चित्रकार जैसे कारीगरों की कला के लिए अपने दिल में थोड़ी सी जगह बना� या बहुत कॉर्डेड ऑगमेंट ग्रेट घर में हमारे लिए घर में हमारे लिए राइट कूल सो में हमारे यू हैव अ गुड व्यू नाउ आई हैव अ लॉट ऑफ अदर फिल्म्स व्हिच आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू शो 
and uh, you want me to now join this link, right? I don't see a link. Oh, email. So we are now moving into the slightly more heavy duty part of uh, using Gen AI. 45 more? Got it. Someone's got to let me in into the meeting. Recording in progress. Got it. I'm sharing screen. <coughs> and we are going to the. Wait, wait, wait. Shoka. Yeah, in marketing, right? Cool. Okay. Okay. Good. Cool. This is muted now. Great. Cool. So uh, here's this. Uh, uh, you know, with the, that primer in marketing. See, the idea was to give you guys a broad-based view of what all does marketing does, right? And you will realize that there are parts of it where Gen AI is now already finding kind of applications. Whatever you guys are going to see are basically things which we are doing on a daily basis. So this is all in market. None of this is uh, right. really still a, a on paper or a, a thought which might happen later, right? So how do we look at this? We look at this, uh, you know, in kind of three phases. Uh, at least I believe that there's an augmentation phase which we are going through. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, marketing today will just get augmented uh, with the use of AI. There is going to be a lot of transformation, which I'm sure it has already started happening in bits and pieces, but workflows, people capabilities, culture, all of it is going to get transformed, right? And we are seeing early signs of this happening. And then there's going to be monetization, right? So all which marketing does using Gen AI, I think there's going to be a time when there will be ability or at least opportunities to create new revenue streams for organizations which do it right, right? Because the technology itself is breaking down a lot of barriers. Yeah. I think the biggest barrier it's breaking down is between publishers and advertisers. An advertiser who can, can truly choose to be a publisher with the right, uh, you know, kind of uh, Gen AI implementation. So we'll get into the, uh, like, uh, again, this is kind of a personal perspective to uh, how can one kind of, uh, you know, look at augmentation. So I look at four pillars. I believe there's memorability, right? Which you guys saw probably through some of the videos which marketers try to do. Uh, and you do that just to get noticed in this cluttered world uh, where, where you can do an intervention. There's discoverability, just getting found again during the customer journey with some of those people who were interested or warm to the category. There's viability, getting bought where uh, Gen AI has a big role to play. And then there's building communities, which is long-term engagement. It doesn't therefore need a lot of, uh, you know, consistent, uh, repeated uh, marketing for these customers, right? And then as you build these pillars, they have to stand on these kind of foundations, foundations of insights, capabilities driven by Gen AI, cultural, uh, you know, changes and ability to change with Gen AI, letting go of uh, how you did things in the past and so on. Okay. So we'll get into the details of some of this and, uh, uh, I'll, uh, you know, next I'll go to the case study, which I sent you guys. Uh, but, uh, before that, you know, something which is now happening today, if you open the Omen, uh, by HP page on social, I think you will see some of these posts. So all our social content today, particularly static is now AI generated. Okay. So uh, we, uh, like we started doing this last week after a bit of prep, 
because again there are safety etc of brand safety particularly which and of course ethics of uh, using ai which you have to take into account but what we realized was that somebody somewhere probably in my worldwide team had already trained mid journey on what does the brand omen mean so omen is our uh, top line gaming brand okay and uh, when my team started generating some of these social posts they found that uh, you know the uh, you know the tool basically was already trained on brand safety and was gen you know throwing up things which were quite consistent right so how was this done basically what she did was or let's say when i say she the uh, brand manager she just asked some of the gen ai tools on what are the top 10 trends uh, affecting gaming in 2024 she used some of those to feed into a midjourney tool and ask can you create an abc uh, image which represents this idea uh, she took that and then she used a, a platform like social bees to translate that one image or one post into you know posts which can work across 10 platforms like you know twitter insta tumblr and so on and it just did the job for us versus how things used to happen the creative agency would work with the social media agency to create a social post which will come to the brand manager for approval right and then the brand manager approves the post the post goes live the agency charges me 10000 inr for this entire you know jumping through these hoops right and what did we spend on this entire exercise uh one hour of a manager's time and we have content now for the next 16 weeks So imagine the kind of disruption. Okay, I think it's a order of magnitude of hundred when it comes to social content generation. Does it mean all those people sitting in the agency are going to lose their jobs? I don't believe so. I think what's going to happen is that brands are just going to produce tons of content. Right? I mean, that's what uh, that's the approach which I am taking. I'm just saying today you are unconstrained uh, on cost and production cost. So then why just why don't you just generate more? and engage your audience is more uh, is it going to lead to a plethora of content is it going to become more difficult to get people's attention yes but then you have to kind of do creative stuff for the for that new world that you will live in but today augmentation is just uh, you know uh, is this is how it's happening there is this other example let me just give you a bit of baseline for that first see data got solved in the last 5 years even in organizations which were a bit behind the curve so today i have you know brand data uh, sorry about the uh, text again but i have social data i have ugc i have discoverability data i have third party data which is available you know for me to buy in clean rooms there is contextual data which is coming from what customers are doing within the journeys and so on right so a lot of data sources uh, and then there are these you know let's say 26 top channels where i want to deploy media yeah now what gen ai or rather ai can help you do is that you can help them bring it together right so you can use ai to generate a lot of dynamic content as an extension of a core campaign so imagine you saw that first alisha garima film right where she was saying that hey here's this pc now with uh you know a uh, i safe screen right now imagine the next ad which you saw was hey karan i have this uh PC available today in Sonipat at fifteen percent off in a store near you. Would you like to buy? Right. So today I can truly do this at a segment of one. Again, I am giving a very bad example, but if you had the power of all that data which you have today, you could actually, I could create a million ads. I wouldn't create that one GDN banner which you saw. I would create five million, and I would serve each one of them individually to you. because what is happening is ad tech martech they had already come together there is this you know gen ai tech which is now making a lot of dynamic content generation extremely low cost right so the big issue was why did i not do this earlier because it costed a bomb to generate all this content right simple content like the one i told you i could even do then because that was just a text change but if i had to meaningfully do something which was relevant to karan sitting in you know in sonipat or you know or in a let's say a, and having browsed 
say some certain landing pages on e-commerce, I could never do that, right? So that's what becomes possible in the memorability phase. I'll just take a pause here uh, before we get into the case study uh, questions. You're all with me now, right till now? Okay, so then we'll go on. Okay, so you uh, got this brief, right? I've just summarized the brief here. Yes, please. Yeah, I was just gonna say that um, I understand how this is like very corny, like generates a lot of content. Mm -hmm. But um, for example, the last ad that we saw was very emotional and it, it appealed to like, I don't know, like you make, it makes you feel a lot of things. And right. like we describe augmentation as emotionally engaging. Right. How is it possible that uh, a tool like ChatGPT, for example, can generate something that will impact me as a human as much? Yeah, it's possible, I believe, right? Uh, particularly, see the, uh, and there are two, three things, right? Can it generate an emotional story which can move you? Sophia, it's possible, right? Uh, can it convert it into an audio visual with the existing technology which has the humanness and the warmth of what you saw? They were actually the people you saw were flawed actors. I wasn't happy with some certain performances, right? But then that's that's probably what makes humans endearing, right? So I believe the technology is maybe a bit far away from doing that. But does it have the, uh, you know, the capability today to generate stories? I think yes. Do I have the courage as a marketer to take that story and put it into production? I don't know, right? But I, that's where I believe all of you guys, when you come into the market, you're going to make a big difference because you'll have a lot more courage than people like us who've been, you know, born and brought up in a certain way. And we have these hangups about, oh, she didn't act well. Oh, she didn't have the right expression. Like you will live with that and you will just tell the stories if you want to. Yes, please. It doesn't do that, huh? It can't. Because, so, so sorry, just to pause you on the question, reach is still a function of paid media. I can generate a million posts, but Facebook is still going to charge me for every impression. Right? So I'm still constrained by the number of people. I'm not, I'll not be able to bombard you unless you choose to be bombarded. Go on. Right, right. Which you can use at. Uh, we can hear you. Go on. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Which you can use at any given point of time. You have a lot of like ads to spare. But the other thing, the other way that you can do, you now essentially have a tool that has at its disposal every single, like, you know, supposedly, every single like advertisement that has come about in like so many years. And it can use that to like create something which can be, I mean, it quite literally can be something that is unique than everything else, right? Because cool. it has What's access to all of that. Okay. So let's discuss this after we do the case study. Okay. okay. I don't know. I saw a raised hand here. Let's just do the case study and then come back to you. Okay. Cool. You saw the brief. Yeah. So this was the communication brief. Get these 14 to 16 years old who are, you know, uh, trying to basically buy the first PC and you position it. I, I don't like these superior, cool, et cetera words, but intuitive tech simplified features, right? Yeah. So, uh, taglines, anybody who got a tagline, which you believe really did justice to the brief. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. So that there is with the screen where you can how is that freedom uh, doesn't sound like freedom no this was, this was the one line brief this tagline was specifically about the uh, benefits that we had right there were three benefits that was got it cool so, anybody else got it got you thanks yes please 
your journey, your way. Nice. It's about freedom. Yeah. Did you use Gen AI to generate it or what? Can you share the prompt you uh, put? If you have it handy, just pull it out, please, for me. Yes, please. Behind you. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Pretty simple ones. Like, I think it's very generative. I put chugged in regarding Chromebook, but like, uh, one of them was the flexibility, right? So, like, you mean a tagline? Uh, the Chromebook that goes with you wherever you go. How's that freedom? Freedom to take it where you want. Take it in whichever manner you want. Category hai to. Cool, no way. Yeah. Anybody else? You see, I'm very opinionated about marketing, so you'll have to put up with me on that. Yes, please. Where's freedom? Cool. Because you have the freedom to write your story. Okay, God. Understood. Last one, please. I got unleashed freedom. Unleashed freedom. Cool. Got it. Just pull out the prompt if you can, please. Yeah. Cool. So here's what happened, guys. Okay. So after we gave this brief, these scripts came. Okay. And uh, I wasn't happy with the tagline which came from the agency. So I started working with ChatGPT and I started generating taglines and I kept telling the agency, oh, why don't you try this? Oh, this is what is missing, right? So this is what it gave me, unleashing potential, your freedom. Oh, this is what you said, right? Your freedom, your way, yeah? And then, uh, you know, I said, just give me more. I'm not happy with that. And they gave me five. And then I just kept, you know, uh, fine tuning it up a bit more, focus more on freedom, get something. And, you know, all these things came. I wasn't happy. I sent uh, these, like some of the samples which I liked, I just sent to the creative agency. Yeah. This is what the creative agency came up with. Freedom is what you do with it. Yeah. And I instantly loved it. Right. So, not generative AI. Okay. Human intelligence. Right. That is what kind of appeal. Helped tremendously. I think. Uh, we would have never come to this, okay? Had it not been Gen AI, because I would never have had that kind of material to push back and say, guys, these are six more areas around the idea of freedom which you haven't explored, right? So I kept telling them again, hey, this is what I did not like about your ABC. So let's watch the films and then come. Are yeah. Should I uh, unmute here? It will echo, no? Yeah, it's going to echo. What do we do? Oh, great. Battery yeah, let's just watch one more. Project <laughs> 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 You guys look up the rest of the films, but uh, you, you get the idea, right? So I think in the creative process, it's already playing a role. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would love to just hear Puneet on how could I, I done better prompting, right? Come to something like this and then let go of the rest of the creative agencies and become the creative myself. Yeah. But uh, that's where we are, I think, on memorability. I'm going to move on to... Right, so discoverability and... Okay, so some heavy duty stuff now coming up your way, but uh, 
you know this is a huge problem today so what's really happening is that i'm showing all these beautiful ads i'm getting a lot of people interested in the brand and then somewhere in the middle funnel i'm just losing them right so what happens is they come in they do exploration right they are looking for more things etc uh, they want to expand the consideration set they say hey this is not the only thing i want to consider i am going to buy more this is not an impulse purchase right pcs are a very involved purchase i am sure all of you have gone through it and then they want to do comparisons but then they are also doing evaluation at the same time right and they keep going back and forth in the journey so they reaffirm the choice through reviews sometimes they do it sequentially sometimes they just you know try to do it simultaneously with two or three things so it's extremely difficult actually to make sense of what is happening today in the middle of the funnel right because uh, uh, you might believe but data is still not very deterministic right so it's very difficult to say what is this person doing on amazon and but still doing an exploratory search on youtube at the same time right so uh, so therefore what do we what did we do so what we did was we just looked at all the search queries which are coming okay again impossible to read i'm going to just explain what is happening here so we just looked at all the google searches and we said let's classify them under these four five buckets there are price led searches people saying hp pavilion price right application led searches where people are saying student laptop and searching then how to use a laptop for editing videos there are brand led searches hp laptop second highest search in the country by the way right so and then component led searches hp laptop with 16 inch screen with uh, whatever 16 jb abc right and uh, uh, 35% of these queries by the way are around pricing which shows there is high intent to buy right so these are those people top uh, you know top half of the uh, our chart they are either looking for i can do reinforcement or activation with them right and uh, 43% of the volume is this application component led volume we believe a lot of these people are actually just searching post purchase right but anyway still uh, important because you don't know what is really happening uh, and then you look at youtube led search volume 86% of the volume is around how to okay and then there's quora on forums where micro content uh, people are engaging with a lot more is around application right so my first message guys to you is first do this for your brands when you become brand managers right or you have become category managers understand your category well what is what is it which people are doing right because without this you can't have a ai strategy so what we did was we said hey if you now look at all these platforms and you look at the content which is already there what does hp add as a brand to that content there are these you know fabulous reviews there are there's a site called 91mobiles.com which is doing fabulous content on laptop there is uh, you know tech burner who is doing fabulous reviews on youtube so what do i do i said i am going to classify all these searches into two kind of searches i am going to say which are the low competition searches right there's a there's a major like hp laptop kind of a search which is happening very difficult to create content which is anyway you know doing well and i don't think i can do as a brand today without opening a studio of my own and then there is these searches which are low competition but high in velocity there's a still a reasonable number of searches happening here so we said this is where we will participate right high velocity but low competition searches more you know specific around, around applications around pricing and so on so what did we do so we got this ai based tool called bus sumo what it does is that it searches for relevant keywords so i say that hey tell me what are the relevant keywords around uh, gaming laptops because that's some place where i want to gain market share okay so what's your gut feel your gut says searches will be around laptop for game development right laptop for playing valorant that's the kind of searches you expect to happen what we found was there was lot of searches happening around unity game development and there was not enough content around it okay so immediately what we did we went to chat gpt we told them hey here is the seo keywords give me a blog 
on unity game development so he gave me a blog or she gave me a blog right and then uh, i just analyzed the platforms on how do i make this content now suitable for different platforms and i obviously added the hp value proposition in the blog right and uh, we just you know uh, uh, so yeah this i already covered you integrate hp value propositions and what you do is then you use a ai based text to video converter you feed it the text in and a video comes out and uh, you get cost effective video creation i post it on youtube because there are uh, organic queries happening around it i get discovered right so i can elevate suddenly discoverability by uh, you know uh, like 10000 views at a time but if i can do it 100 times over i can do it uh, like a get a 4 million views incremental discoverability right so we used aisa nahi and ki ye nahi hota tha this used to happen always but my uh, machinery could produce one blog a week because there was a writer who used to write the blog there used to be a category manager who used to you know check for errors then there used to be a brand guy who used to say oh the brand guideline is not right let me fix abc and then by the time the blog went out it take me one you know best case one to two blogs in a week now we are doing 10 blogs a week and we are doing video yeah so the again the order of magnitude just changes significantly possibly efficiency also increases because we you are obviously because it is so optimized now because the seo optimization etc again you don't have to engage somebody you can uh, you know do a lot more yeah so just some examples of how so uh, this was a query on why aio pcs are a good choice for households right this just the brand manager decided that this should be the search keyword but i'm sure that's not people would be saying uh, desktops for household use right so uh, like our the ai generated video is now the top video it's beating a lot of the other uh, you know content which is generated by uh yeah yeah and then of course uh, what we do is we use crawlers to keep reading what what is happening on quora what's happening on uh, uh, you know blog sites etc if somebody comes and asks a question i still haven't found a like a ai based way to do it but we have somebody who goes and posts our generated blog as an answer because it truly helps the customer the customer is saying hey i want to figure out pcs will do these five things and uh, you know uh, there is no way she can find out because five brands are coming and telling her hey buy me buy me buy me buy me but i'm just saying hey this is the what you need here's the answer and by the way here's an hp laptop which will probably meet your needs okay so cool so now uh, we'll jump to e-commerce so this was middle of the funnel right now i'm moving below down below in the funnel and we'll take questions together on middle and uh, lower okay so uh, busy chart but uh, see there are three main things maybe i'll skip this one there are three big use cases in e-commerce okay why is e-commerce a great place to implement generative ai one there is lot of ugc there is just a plethora of user generated content right so what i can do is again i know you can't read this but what i can do is i can read all those uh, you know uh, comments and reviews and i can make sense of it for the brand what is it which is important for the customer instead of doing a focus group and asking 10 people i can now do it with 500000 reviews and then take action secondly there is so much data getting generated how do you make sense of it today for example sitting here i want to know what are the top 5 selling pcs uh, on uh, flipkart yesterday what would you typically do you would call a flipkart and say sir can you please send me data you know maybe it will come in a week's time and then you will sort and then you will see and so today i can just write a query uh do a whatsapp based you know api integration to my database and i can query my database on whatsapp and i can say tell me what who were the top uh, you know rated products yesterday right and you would uh, get your answer yeah so uh natural language query optimization therefore i mean that helps thirdly content optimization right so uh there's so much content again on my product page yeah and uh, okay i'll just maybe explain that with an example 
so uh, we talked about viability right so just look at this piece first what it basically says is that what is viability viability is basically ability of a product page view you okay if you guys have your pcs or mobile phones just open the amazon app and search laptop or maybe let's search hp laptop okay let's just do that uh you what you see is a search engine results page which is called the scrp if you click on any of those listings you come to a product page my ability to convert that product page view into a purchase is viability simple with me i think i lost half the class <laughs> okay so great cool so uh now on that you see three things you see ratings right and reviews you see an availability score only if it is available it will by the way come up now those uh, un, uh, those things don't come up anymore and then there's a content score right if i have the images the content the pricing the description all of that so now what i can do is i can keep looking at all my data and uh, let's just go to the bigger example so here's a review which is written by somebody right there are 500000 such reviews and more are getting added now see ai still uses that same technology which actually was being used in 2003 4 right the technology actually hasn't changed yes there have been incremental changes but the fundamental idea of using neural networks to make sense of text is actually a very very old technology i actually remember writing a paper in 2003 with my professor when i was doing engineering on anm right and it still said said the same we just couldn't imagine the kind of changes it will bring right so what does it do it's able to do to basically read the review and say this review is about display quality it is about performance and it is about value for money and associate a number with it is what gen ai brings in or let's say ai brings in this is not really gen ai right so now i am able to read all those reviews and say for this particular segment actually my biggest issue is not my product my delivery packaging had a problem most people were complaining about my packaging not my product and if i fix that my rating will improve and therefore my viability will improve right so i'm going to rush through some of this okay and then there is this right uh, when you guys search some of you would have seen right these uh, uh, just be please just stop me when i'm done uh the before so uh this is how all pcs used to look okay because generating an image again and regenerating and changing it was just hell of a investment right see pc category all skews change every 6 months right and if you had to do repeatedly for every skew every 6 months it's a lot of investment now of course changes with gen ai so i keep uh, not me but this e-commerce guy kept in you know reiterating with these hp logos and eventually came up with something which was suddenly getting we don't know why but it was getting a lot more clicks okay it broke through the clutter i think also it used the brand a lot more right cool so i'll not do all these three now on community i'll just show you one video okay uh so this is a case and if you guys again have internet access just open printlearncenter.com this is a community for uh, learners for the print business what we do is we create worksheets so we've created 50000 worksheets for kids to be able to learn without a screen okay all that you need to do is download the worksheet print it on your printer and you are ready to learn right now uh okay let's see the video and then we'll maybe talk about it oh yeah this one doesn't sound and it's going fast but i'll explain what's happening so what is really happening is okay i'm going to play it again okay so someone's now here using mid journey to produce a worksheet which earlier needed a graphic designer a teacher uh, and a, you know start like somebody who puts the display etc into place so this is now a worksheet collection on symbols of india generated 
possibly within like five minutes. It took us three years of work with creative designers, with educationists to come to the first 15,000 worksheets. And it took me a million dollars because I wanted a certain quality, right? Because I said, oh, it has to be as per the NEP 2023. It has to be verified and signed off by a educationist who says that, yes, this is fit for learning and this will actually move a child forward in learning, right? And then we just, uh, you know, kind of uh, this thing came around and it it took a lot of experimentation, honestly, to come to this stage. But then we are at a stage where we can potentially generate a lot of these worksheets and go from 15,000 to 15 million in a, what, a month's time. Yeah. So that's on community. I'll just skip the other two examples, very similar. So yeah, if you have time for questions, right, guys? Okay, great. Okay. Questions, thoughts? I'm going to skip this one. Um, yes, please. Hi, I had a question uh, about the e-commerce part. So, you know, you spoke about getting insights. Even as consumers, we get that on Zomato when we look at reviews for restaurants, you know, the keywords. So I wanted to ask, uh, are these provided by Amazon or as a brand, can you scrape for more stuff because if it's provided by Amazon, practically every brand would, you know, avail it. So, um, to differentiate on e-commerce, does Even it if matter? it can be scraped, everyone can do it. Hmm. So, uh, my question was to differentiate, uh, does it matter how you use those insights or is there also more to it? Always. That's why I shared all HP, you know, uh, trade secrets with you. Even if some of you joined Dell, Unless you have the agency to get it done, it will not get done, right? But I mean, I just believe that uh, the ecosystem will just benefit from more people doing it. So I'm just sharing something which is, uh, you know, in situ. Yes, please. So you talked about using um, Jenny as generated content for like multiple platforms, right? So how do you control for quality here? Because most users can easily identify between like very, very generic content plus content that's actually written by some, by someone. So how do you control for that certain tone of voice when you're generating so much content on a daily or weekly basis on multiple platforms? See, tone of voice, I think will become easy, easier to control with time because these are intelligent systems. They actually learn faster than humans, right? And another big issue which I have is people turn over, people leave. My trained people, like best of years, I get a 3 to 4% attrition. And all that knowledge goes away with them. That doesn't change with systems, right? So is it there already? Probably not. And, you know, with the human, the naked eye, you can differentiate between a Gen AI content, etc. In some time, probably it will become more and more difficult. From a brand safety perspective, actually, I'm not very concerned. I think that's the easier thing to take care of. Actually, the more prior change there was since that GPT-4, GPT-4, you can customize the GPT. I've done it for my favorite All the answers you give are with that. Instructor learning. There's a particular, ah, there's a short learning instruction. So GPT-4, that's a part of the deal. So I've given that, and you can give up to like a 2,000, 3,000 words uh, thing. And then GPT, for, 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 from then on, it will kind of use that tone of voice, that thing for everything that you do. So it's pretty much there. True. Right. I think instructed LLMs is the way forward yeah. for us to, for a lot of and enterprise use cases. Personalized to you. Yeah, but see, enterprise versions, you've got to uh, still do that in four. Yeah, anyway, uh, go on, please. Yeah. See, relevance continues to be a big differentiator. The things which have not changed are your ability to know your customer better, right? And uh, therefore, uh, you know, 
just doing it in a way which is more relevant i showed you some examples of personalization right uh, i think creativity on even on finding relevance continues to play a big role right and then uh, see differentiation i think is a very top of funnel kind of a uh, you know uh, kind of matter to handle so as long as i keep creating some of these you know beautiful films probably there's a route to differentiation products remain a route to differentiation do make better products why do you need advertising always to differentiate yourself do better pricing right create better innovation that's a great way to differentiate your brand it's not the marketer's job alone to differentiate the brand Um, this is actually related to the question which I like had like before, and then you said like hold on, like yeah, yeah, go the thing. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, there are there are two like you know ways in which I can see forward. Like one, which is like kind of happening right now, not necessarily with social media posts, but like content in general. There are a lot of um new sites out there that like are are essentially run by AI, and like they generate around some a thousand like you know articles within like a week or something like that. Um, so. That's that's one model wherein you can just churn out like a pack of a lot of content at one particular go and like have that released. Or you can do another thing wherein you essentially have this tool which has access to some of the greatest, like, you know, most creative pieces out there and can then is specifically designed such that you can pick and choose like some really great creative creative points and then create like a really unique and creative, like, you know, single like creative or something like that, right? Now, granted, that will be like very low in number because you're essentially going through this insanely difficult filtration process, but you essentially have the tool to do that. Now, like my question... The tools existed before Gen AI. They were called humans. No, sure. And now we have like, you know, something that can do so, which is not going to get paid. So like that, so it is like, it, it's more accessible and like cheaper as well. But the thing is, I've seen a lot of different, like, you know, entities out there follow the first model. Not many like... Not many institutes like follow the second model. Do you think that people are gonna just stick with the first model because it's easier? Because the second model involves like a like a lot of prompt generation. It requires a lot of expertise. The tools are not sophisticated enough. Suppose what it is. About, of course, we will. I mean, why did I move to all those other tools? Because they are more efficient. The businesses gain. Why did the all businesses move to PCs in the eighties? Because PCs are just a more efficient way of working. Computerization, digitization is just more efficient. If it is more productive, everybody will do that. And why not? Right? Um, so like the follow up, like can I have a follow up to that? Sure, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay, two lucky people get to ask more questions. Yes, please. That's an interesting word. <laughs> Enabled, let's say. Yeah. Interesting question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there is... Uh, I don't know what to call it, but marketing subject matter experts working on this, you know, cusp of technology and marketing. I think maybe you call them content strategists or something. That's that's a job which, uh, you know, would definitely get created. I also believe that marketers are very well placed now in this new era because uh, marketers are great at asking the right questions. And if you know what are the questions to ask, uh, you know, you will probably take up a lot of the other jobs in the company. So, yeah. Yeah, okay, last one. And someone who's, who's not asked a question yet. Okay. Yeah.
Right. That Microsoft is doing. They are doing it very well. Huh? And I think I hope we'll see some of that in yeah. this course. So yeah. No, no, I was just saying that. Yeah. See, yeah. we are more of a hardware company, right? So we we'll do end up doing a lot more of the edge AI work. How do I bring a lot more AI to this device and uh, you know enable a lot of data capture around from your ecosystem and enable this device to work better? Yeah. Super. Uh, in fact, he was just kind of handing over. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> SP is over now to Microsoft. <laughs> so you know, last time Microsoft actually did these guys did not show you that. Okay, they have actually done a lot of work. I think they did not show because probably they are not allowed to show yet. But uh, somewhere during the rest of the, sometime, I hope in the future of work part, I hope to steal that video, okay, and show you that video, though it's out in the public domain, to be honest, okay, but uh, on how some of this completely amazing stuff is happening, like the stuff that you talked about. And I also do believe, you know, that one of the things which we'll talk about, probably something called AJI, Okay, and which I think Rahul spoke about last time, where some of this will actually not be sitting in the cloud, but will be sitting in the uh, devices themselves, and therefore much become much faster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so we'll do that. But anyway, you know, one of the reasons why we did this session uh, right up front okay, is is that I believe, and we'll talk about this as we go forward, that generative AI, you know, and in fact, tomorrow my Mint article tomorrow says. That, Generative AI is going to be assistive for many companies, industries, functions. It will help assist. And most and almost every industry or function, it will be assistive. But for some, it will be disruptive. Contact centers, for example, is one. Okay, where it could be disruptive. Uh, programming, software programming, okay, is another where it could be disruptive and where clearly it could be disruptive is marketing. Right. What we saw today, largely because we are in the beginning, was the large was a lot of assistive. <laughs> right. Okay, because you know, you know, and <laughs> but you know, as as uh, Prashant said that uh you know we all still come with baggage. When you go out there you won't be coming with any baggage of how it was done in the good old days. And so a lot of disruption then would happen and maybe the marketing function would look very different from the way it looks right now. It clearly will. Okay, and there'll be there'll be jobs, but they'll have very different descriptions. Okay, and so you know, so that's the reason we did this up. The reason why Prashant and HP, honestly, I speak with a lot of people out there in industry, and a lot of there's a lot of talk about how you know this is going to change this, this is going to change this. But there are very few places where it's actually happening. So everything that Prashant showed you today, he's actually doing it. Okay? And he's kind of, you know, he and his team are kind of uh, changing the way they work. And, and I know he has a lot more of these uh, examples because of time. You have to restrict yourself to two or three or four of them. But, but I think we're all lucky, including me, that we're actually seeing this happen in front of our eyes as to and real work and how that real marketing works is getting assisted, disrupted, and you know, enhanced uh, in so many ways. So thank you so much, Prashant, for coming all the way from Mumbai and you know, demonstrating that. Thank you. Perfect. Hello, everyone. So thanks for the wonderful introduction, Jaspreet. Um, I work in PwC, as Jaspreet mentioned. But uh, I would like to introduce myself as somebody who's passionate about technology is uh, always trying to find out what's the most cutting edge tech that could disrupt things. Uh, I, I, I keep thinking about what's the next innovation that could transform, uh, you know, things that we've already been taught about. So I was a backbencher, you know, in my engineering days. I used to kind of figure out, you know, things that I'm being taught right now will get um, redundant with time. Do I even need, need to learn these at the moment? So traditionally, I was always on the lookout of something that is new. Uh, and then I used to kind of grab that when it was starting to get hot to understand. And in this domain, when something is new or being defined, there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of art, less of science, less of technology, but more of art 
in terms of defining the way forward, in terms of <clears throat> in terms of defining what technology could do. So I, I grabbed this uh, bandwagon of generative AI about 10 to 11 months back, uh, started working on generative AI, tried to kind of grow myself in terms of defining what it could do, right? And sometimes, disc I have two disclaimers to give today. Disclaimer number one, this is not a technology class, this is an arts class, because what I tell you today could be wrong, what I tell you today could change tomorrow, but it's just my rendition of the art of possible with generative AI. So that's disclaimer number one. Disclaimer number two is, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve disclaimer number two till the end, but, but we'll start with this, okay? So whatever you see here today is my rendition of what would it take for us to interact with intelligent systems and an insight on prompt engineering. Again, my own rendition. So the, the, the reason I kind of got interested on prompt engineering, I was trying to talk to my mother about chat GPT. I said, this could solve half your problems. You keep ringing me, I'm in meetings, I can't solve your problems. Take this tool and then you could ask it whatever you want. It will create your fancy small articles. Uh, you need help in typing up your email to your clients. This could kind of solve your problem. And then my mother asked me a question, then that got me more interested in the deeper things associated with this technology. So my mom asked me, you know, it's, it's like magic, right? This, it's a black box. You ask it a question, I get an answer. I don't know how it works. I don't know how to control it. I don't know if I could orient it to my liking. I don't know if I could give it the power to talk like me. So these were the things that kind of got me started in this journey. And I'll share some of the learnings that I've done or a framework that I've created to understand prompt engineering and implement it. Before we get started, uh, I'll just uh, talk about the uh, you know structure of today's session. So we'll start with a two minute activity very, very quickly. And then at the end, what we'll do is we'll try to disrupt the marketing world with Prashant here today. So that's the last 20 minutes and that's the most exciting part of uh, today's session. So stay tuned till the end. I know you would be able to uh, take a lot of things today, but to be able to master prompt engineering, I'll have to give you a sneak peek of what lies under the hood in this technology. So bear with me, if things get too technical, I'll try to abstract all the tech. Uh, but again, whatever you can take, as I said before, this is an arts class, not a tech class. So whatever you can take today, create your own story, create your own rendition, and create your own understanding of prompt engineering, because that's what makes humans special, right? We have to understand things in our own context to make it uh, get the power of what we want to achieve. Otherwise, it will be same for everybody, right? As somebody asked in the previous session, what, what is a differentiator between X and Y? It's your rendition in terms of un understanding this technology. Very, very focused to this technology at the moment, but let's start the session. Uh, this is a quick uh, kind of a one minute activity. Can anybody of you recognize any faces here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> perfect, yeah. 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 So this was, I think, uh, back in 2014, a technology called GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks, kind of came into the picture. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I, I read this on Reddit, so again, uh, no source, uh, no true source. But the reason this technology was created was there, was a, there were a lot of anime fans in Japan, and they wanted new anime content, and the anime content took time for, you know, to, to hit the market. So some engineer, crazy engineer, figured out a way to create this technology to be able to, yeah, thank you. So to, to create this technology, to create new content. So that's the GAN world for you. I'll not go into a lot of details uh, on the image part for today's session, because what I've tried to do for today's session is put some method to the madness of, you know, an input and a magical output. Okay, so we'll, we'll come to the image generation part probably later because that's a bit more complex to understand, but we'll start with the text world and let's see, you know, we'll take it from there. So I'll show you a quick video. This cartoon video, you know, uh, was created back in 2004. So somebody had thought about this 
technology. So we'll, we'll have a look at this video. Okay. So we'll have to share a particular screen. Okay, that's it, right? I'll have to probably share a particular screen yeah. for this to work. I think you have to unmute as well. Unmute as well. Let's try this one. Oh, I've see. already seen. I think it worked. Did it work? Yeah. Perfect. So South Park cartoon back in 2004, and this is somebody. Somebody wrote this out. The little boy was kind enough to let us show you his robot, the Osimo 4000. I've already seen what it can do. Uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, that's. Oh. We'll try that one. Apologies, Apologies for the technical This little boy was kind enough to let us show you his robot, the Osimo 4000. I've already seen what it can do. Uh, excuse me, sir, but uh, that's not a robot. It's not? No, it clearly has bipedal movement, so the correct term is computerized automatron. Oh, very nice, Mitch. You are the smart one. Well, regardless, I believe maybe this automatron can help us... And this little boy was kind enough to let us show you his robot, the Osimo 4000. I've already seen what it can do. Uh, excuse me, sir, but that's not a robot. Bipedal movement. The correct term is computerized automatron. So I believe can help us come up with new movie ideas. How can a robot come up with better ideas for movies than us? Watch this. Osimo, given the current trends of the movie going public, can you come up with an idea for a movie that will break a hundred million box office? And, okay, how about this? Okay, Adam Sandler is like in the movie, but then it turns out that this girl is actually a golden retriever or something. So again, you get the idea, right? This is probably Prashant back in HP thinking about ideating and wow, this is cool. Let's let's start writing this down. Let's improving our marketing brief and going forward. Somebody thought about this in 2004, and uh, you know these cartoons kind of have been forward-looking. You know the Simpsons cartoons and everything. So I take a lot of inspirations from futuristic cartoons because that that's wo that's where most of the creative folks used to work, right? Uh, to create new content, and you know, cartoon was a hot space. So to get started for this session, what we'll do, very, very quick activity. We'll start from that corner, or we'll start from here. And one by one, again, a traditional you know, school exercise, but I would want you to start creating a story uh, for a cartoon, let's say Doraemon, okay? One line, one line, one line, and we'll pass it on. And we'll try to create a story, okay? Two stories, one from this side, one from that side. Okay, we'll start with you. Okay, so Nobita is going towards the jungle. Yeah, one line only. He wants to talk to Shizuka. <laughs> but he sees Jian in the way. Jian starts singing a song. Um. Um, the song is about a dog. Then Sunio enters. <laughs> The song is very unbearable and all of them are, all of them. Nobita calls Doraemon. They suddenly ha hear a loud sound from the forest. They get scared. The anywhere door appears. Doraemon comes out of But Doraemon cannot access his pouch. 
He tries finding it. Doraemon has lost his pouch in the future. <laughs> Doremi appears. Wow. Doremi finds the finds the pouch. Jian finally stops singing. <laughs> <laughs> Nobita asks Doraemon to send all of them away so that he can spend time with Shizuka. Sudden entrance of Ninja Hattori cross crossover <laughs> <laughs> crossover episode. Uh, Ninja Hattori makes Doraemon realize the you know damning weight of the realization that he's lost his powers. Jian mm -hmm. <coughs> got angry to enter Ninja Thodi and started beating Novita. Novita cried. Uh, Amara is trying to stop the fight. Wow, perfect. So, you know, you led each other to kind of the next statement. Uh, do we want to exercise, you know, you want, you want to exercise your creative muscles as well? Or should we kind of come back for a different activity to you guys? But you get the idea, right? You are passing on a prompt to the next person to respond, right? So that's the essence of what prompt engineering is. I'll give you a glimpse of, and before I do that, so this is, you know, the fundamental cartoon Doraemon, right? The worst prompt engineer, uh, you know, I've written the first prompt engineer, but it's the worst prompt engineer. Nobita never knew what to ask for, and every time, <laughs> Doraemon used to give a, give a different gadget to solve Nobita's problems, which you know he did not know how to use then. So, weak direction, lack of knowledge, and the most important part, Nobita was unaware of Doraemon's power. So he never asked for the most, you know, the, the thing that could solve his problem. Right? He always used to kind of let Doraemon figure out a tool which could would not solve his problem, or you know, sometimes in some cases, increase the problem. So, like, let's, so we'll start with the level Nobita and we'll kind of improve from there today. Okay, so we'll move on. But then, pre as discussed in the previous slide, to master prompt engineering, you'll have to first understand, you know, what you could do with Generative AI. Only then you'll be able to kind of play with Generative AI. If you don't know what to do, then again, it's as magical as it is for my mom. Right? You ask a question, you get a response. So what's the power of generative AI? While, again, there are a lot of interpretations that are ongoing, some people say that you can do pretty much anything with generative AI. What I, have, what I think, I think in three fundamental buckets, and these are some of the applications of generative AI. So there are three areas or three horizons, as I like to call them. The first one is a productivity boost. So whatever your mundane tasks are, transactional tasks are, those come in horizon one, which give you an immediate productivity boost. The second horizon is transformation. You know, sorry, the second horizon is augmentation. You create new value, which you did not believe existed before. So that's horizon number two, which is augmentation. The third one is transformation, where you did not even know that you could do something with the same aesthetics of a problem and disrupt a particular industry. So that's horizon number three. Again, horizon number three is still exploratory. A lot of things that I do today with generative AI still fall on bucket number one and bucket number two. So what you could do with generative AI, you could discover with generative AI. You could gain insights with AI, with Gen AI. You could create new things with generative AI. You could summarize content with generative AI. And you know, in, uh, for the scope of this session, we'll keep it focused more on the text side of the house. The last and the most interesting one, which again falls in horizon one is automate. You could automate a lot of tasks that you do with generative AI. Now, since we start to understand the possibilities with generative AI, we, we need to kind of think in terms of, you know, how is it different than AI? And a lot of textbook definitions today say that generative AI is a subset 
of artificial intelligence. And I said in my disclaimer, I will be completely wrong today. But my interpretation is, generative AI is everything AI, also with the delta. And I'll try to sh tell you what I feel in this regards. Why is it a bigger superset than traditional AI? So Gen AI, in my definition, which is wrong, text, you know, it's a wrong textbook definition, but Gen AI is AI plus delta. And I'll talk about that delta and the magic. Why is it different? I'll skip the you know, traditional AI versus Gen AI, what you could do, what you could not do. Probably this is something that you could imagine. But just to show you the power of AI versus Gen AI in a traditional ecosystem that we used to kind of work before, when we used to create applications to respond to humans, right? In the, in the traditional world of AI, we used to write rule engines, right? If the user ordered a cappuccino, please give him three options, small, medium, large. And the problem with this was, how many rules can you write? It's infinite. How much knowledge could you bake in to an AI model which you are trying to optimize with one task to serve better coffee? So again, uh, the under the hood of what Gen AI text world is, the GPT transformer model, which kind of Google figured out in 2017. But in layman terms, it was so simple that anybody could have imagined it. So what they said, Every time a problem comes up to us, we start creating narrow AI models to solve that problem, right? Can we just create one model which is large enough, understands the world, and we can use that to perform any kind of downstream tasks? So that's the concept in layman terms of what a large language model can do. Now to go on and understand, and this is the Gen AI magic, you know, you, Prashant talked about it. Input, the output, the input, the output. But what is under the hood in terms of the LLMs? So you can harness the power to you know, write better prompts, to use it to your advantage. Uh, I, I'll try to tell you that. But uh, we, as engineers, used to kind of figure out what's the most important prog programming language. I learned that. I'll be able to interact with machines and find my way, way around it. That's what my engineering objective was. Today's date. This has changed. The most powerful language, programming language, is English. So, and if you've mastered a clear thought process, English, you'll be able to work with engineers or as engineers to create these products. So you, and you know, people talk about what's the industry that's going to get disrupted, right? I feel everything is getting disrupted. And I've spent, you know, last few months I've spent, spent with the team that thought they could not be disrupted, which is the infrastructure team at PwC. So I've spent more than 350 hours over the last couple of months and created those, their value chains. And I, I can tell you with certain degree of confidence that, you know, they are rethinking in what could Gen AI do for their business and what is left for them to do at the moment. So that's the kind of discussions I'm having with those teams. The worst possible, you know, the, the industry that I thought would, would not, would be the least excited about such a technology is the most excited, you know, because the, the power of what Gen AI can do. So again, a glimpse of how LLMs are created, and I talked about the analogy of uh, creating one large AI model that can do anything. So what they have done, they have, uh, taken large sets of text and you, you can imagine it as a human being who's read all the text, right? Example, let's say person A has read all the text. Can it reproduce everything with 100% accuracy? Probably not. So that's what a Gen AI model is, right? It is read through large documents of text, whatever, whatever is available and probably they keep improve, improving and increasing that with, with more and more volumes of text. The most essential part of what an LLM has is an understanding of the physical and the human world. So when I create solutions today, I don't leverage the LLM for the data it has. I leverage the LLM for the understanding of the human world it has, and then utilize that to move forward my use cases, my problems, and my uh, solutions that I'm building. So again, you know, though with this large 
volume of text that the LLM has consumed, it has formed an understanding of what is right, what is wrong. You know, if I throw an apple in the air, it will come down. All those things, it, it has trying to create a relationship of this text and, and, and an understanding of the world, which we can harness to then create things that we want with generative AI. So very, very quick layman glimpse of what is sitting behind LLMs. You can imagine it as a room, right? Let's say that room has, and you have to bake, bake in a lot of data in that room, right? I have tried to create a mind palace inside look of an LLM. Let's say there are fruits, vegetables, dogs, cats, and somebody comes up and says, Puneet, can you please divide these elements and box them in different rooms? Apple is a fruit, Apple is a technology company. Where do, where do I put Apple? That's the, that's the question that I'll ask because A for Apple, right? First thing that I will look is for the Apple. But let me figure out, I'll, I'll try to represent these elements in some shape and form in this room. And that's where the concept of vectors come in. These individual words have a lot of associations with different things. So a large multi-dimensional representation is required to fit and map that to a room or a black box. So that is essentially what an LLM is, right? It's a vector mapping of associations of the text it has read. Yeah, so, and, and just to kind of for the class as well as for you, Puneet, uh, Ranjani uh, is, is coming in next uh, session, next Friday mm -hmm. or Thursday, and she's actually going to go much deeper into the black box and talk about some of these vectors, etc., etc. Perfect. So think of today as a preview, in a sense, <coughs> more, uh, more involved discussion on that. So also for your FYI. Perfect. Perfect. So I'll, I'll not go deeper into this, but this is just to kind of spark that thought on how should you treat a chat GPT model. So if you think this behind, you know, when you're trying to create or interact with chat GPT, and if you have this associations map kind of there in your mind that this would know that Apple is also a tech company, also a fruit, right? Can, can, can it write an analogy for, for the company Apple how it started as not you know Steve Jobs idea but Isaac Newton's idea of a fruit falling on Isaac Newton's head and probably creating a new company so that's the power of what you could use these relationships for to create new things okay so now we'll get onto the topic hopefully you are warmed enough to prompt engineering now to put it in layman terms the basics the 101 is you, you need to ask better questions. And you'll say, Puneet, that's, that's something that I knew, right? You can go further and analyze things that you want. I, I'll talk about, uh, I'll skip this in the interest of time. And I will talk about fundamental operations that you could do with LLMs or ChatGPT. So essentially today, what you could do, there are three things. There are three things that you could do. There's a reductive operation, from, you can go from large bodies of text to a small body of text. Summarization probably falls in this bucket. The second one is transformation. You use the same text and you transform that text, uh, refactor it or use it for new meaning. The last one is generative, where you create new things which did not exist before with context. So these are three fundamental operations that you can perform uh, with generative AI. <laughs> Now this is something that you know I, I spoke about earlier as well. In today's world, I see people writing emails with ChatGPT. And I also see people, and I'm one of them, who read emails through ChatGPT. Right? And I was just discussing this with Jaspreet. Can I share that, LinkedIn? So Jaspreet said that he gets a lot of inbound messages, he gets a lot of LinkedIn uh, you know, kind of comments, and 50% of them, Jaspreet kind of auto replies with generative AI. So that's the magic. It, it's on both sides of the table. You can create, you can digest, you can reduce, you can summarize, you can auto reply. So it's disrupting everything. Sure. Perfect. So these, so are, these, are, these are three fundamental operations that you can do with text. So again, keep this in mind. Reductive operations go from big to small. Transformation, change, restructure or refactor, 
and the third one is create. I'll go into the specifics of each of these three and most of your prompt engineering skills will be applied to all these three areas. And we have an activity planned at the end of the session where we'll do a similar activity for the world of marketing. We'll do a maker, we'll do a checker, all powered by Generative AI. It's okay, I don't have a lot of videos to show. I'll show those links. And actually, next time we bypass Google. That's what is creating problems. Okay, so we'll start with re reductive operations. I'll give you a high level glimpse of what you could do. Uh, these are again pointers that I've tried, I've experimented on. There could be more. But essentially, the core remains the same, right? You go from big to small. So, summarization, you know, it's very obvious. Distillation and extraction. I'll start with extraction and then I'll come to distillation. Extraction is, I upload a resume, a candidate's resume, and I need to extract which school the candidate studied in. So that's extraction. I can do, I can do that with ChatGPT. Summarization is I upload something and you know, it can summarize. It's, it's uh, you know, this thing. What is distillation? If there is a lot of redundancy in somebody's content, right? When we write our answers in, exams, we, we re, re, kind of repeat what we know, uh, you know, umpteen number of times in all our answers. So this could distill those answers to bring out the non-redundant and remove the noise and bring it out. So this, these are three operations. There are four more. There is characterizing, there is analyzing, evaluating, and critiquing. These are again operations that you can perform on text. Right, uh, and these are reductive in nature because you're not essentially changing the nature of text. You're just, in a sense, extracting key meaningful things out of that. And there are blurring boundaries between these three. So you know, uh, again, a disclaimer there. So there's transformation operations here. You are transforming from one content to another, and here you could think of as translation. Right. Uh, this is a multilingual model. LLM models are multilingual today. So you could translate or transform things from one to other. You could think of transformation as um, going from text to image. Well, that is also uh, the next uh, operation that we will perform, which is create. So characterizing, uh, I discussed about characterizing, analyzing, evaluation, and critiquing as part of reductive. Transforming is paraphrasing and why I've put paraphrasing as different than summarizing is I could paraphrase things in my own tone. So that's transformation, right? Uh, it's translation, restructuring and a lot more things that you could do with translation. Uh, this is a quick example, you know, going from Hindi to English. I'll skip that. Generative operations. Now generate is anything and everything that is new, that is that did not exist before. So that's generative operations and what I use generative operations for the most the most for my daily life is for brainstorming right I use it as a pure brainstorming partner to create new ideas and solutions and again the possibilities are limitless you could do so many things with generate but we'll skip that uh, in the interest of so, time so in the beginning of the class some of you might be aware uh, Brinda wrote an email to all of you right welcoming you to the class etc 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 and then what came out from me was the hip hop version of that. Okay, so what was that within these three? Transformation. Yeah, so it was the, just the one before, the transformation part. Basically, the essence remained the same, but it completely transformed itself into a hip hop uh, song. Later on, uh, poor, uh, 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 later on, we, I did something similar where it became a, something else became a Shakespeare sonnet. Okay, so now these things have become actually super easy to do. I mean, for me to make that that hip hop thing, uh, the prompt actually was pretty big. It wasn't just a word to hip hop. Okay, so it was pretty big. It had some tonal things and you know whatever I had whatever, but it took me less than a minute. Yeah. Uh, ideally, it would have taken more. So sorry. Back yeah. to you. No, that's perfect. So these are operations that people are performing now. How do perform these operations, how to improve our prompt engineering skills. There are some components that I've listed down. 
these are instructions uh, Prashant mentioned instructions there is primary content there is content which you need to transform there is content that you need to create right from so there's a, a starting point so starting point could be a primary content there is examples you know if I can give an LLM model, an example of how I would want the output to look like or my past data that I have. For example, I've responded to, responded to 100 emails in a certain manner. If I bake that as examples to the LLM, the 101 email that goes out will try to mimic that tonality. So that's what examples could do. And examples are very, very powerful in the industry. I'll talk about examples in some more detail as well. Another interesting thing is cues. You need to give that LLM model hints, otherwise it's magic, right? You can't ask somebody to act on its own. You have to give it hints, directions, or guardrails or areas where it should act, right? So these are cues. And the last one is supporting content. Chat GPT has, uh, you know, kind of data which is restricted to 2021. I am writing a financial report for a company X, which came out 2020 on, uh, in 2023, a financial commentary around that. How can I do that, right? I'll have to give that supporting content for it to be able to generate. So these are, you know, components of prompt engineering. We'll dive deeper into each of each one of these as well. So the first one is instructions. I've put two types of instructions, simple and simplex. I've not done complex yet. Probably Jaspreet's uh, example was a bit more complex. We'll try to simplex. Okay, so we'll see. We'll try to we'll in in our activity today. We'll try to create a complex instruction right uh, as a marketing brief so again simple instruction write write a weekly newsletter simplex instruction giving it more supporting content give, giving it areas where it can think and then the output varies the completion is the output it fundamentally varies because there is more context to what you're trying to achieve right so just giving you an example of simple and simplex and i would encourage you to spend a lot of time trying to create one complex uh, instruction sheet and try to analyze it in any problem area and I can tell you with you know uh, again some secrets here but I've created so many products right uh, at PwC by just using the instruction prompt engineering right you've created something called the HR AI studio uh, I like to call that so there I'm creating job descriptions which are more contextually relevant to the profile that I'm hiring I am stack ranking CVs right basis the job description fit that I wanted again with set of instructions so you know PwC puts out a job post we get 6,000 7,000 CVs against that job post and traditionally what used to happen again secrets here my recruiter used to give me the top five top ten bases his own analysis now today I could use something like generative AI to read through all 6,000 CVs and get me the most you know the one that fits the you know the bill perfectly the last one is the most interesting one. Uh, what we have done with the HRI Studio is we have uh, a bot that takes your interview, right? Now, and it is hyper personalized to the job description. It is hyper personalized to your CV. So, if you worked at a company X and you were working in marketing there, it would ask you, you know, you worked at company uh, X in marketing and you were trying to uh, market, uh, do some work in this domain. Can you highlight some of the top problems in this domain? So it is more contextual in terms of your interview. It's not a static interview, you know, tell me about yourself and has a fixed set of questions that it can ask. So it becomes more, more and more contextually relevant. And again, you know, the first level of analysis of that interview is also being done by AI. So, uh, yeah. Google Sorry? Google fired 100 people in recruitment yesterday. Okay. Is that probably an outcome of what you've been talking about? Could be, could be. And you know, it, it's every industry at the moment. And I'll, at the last, I'll also talk about the future of jobs. You know, probably that will be of interest to you. What's changing as as uh, companies try to hire in the market? What, you know, how are our job descriptions evolving in the age of generative AI? So we'll, we'll discuss that at the end. So the second, component that I talked about was primary content. If you don't start off with the relevant content, the output would be still, you know, as Prashant mentioned in his example for the HP campaign, we got a very similar response, right? On Prashant's screen and your screen. Probably the reason is there was not enough contextual messages that talked about the brand ethos or 
The other part is that the LLM understood the HP world so well that it was able to create that relevant you know, output upfront. Right? For new things, probably you, know, you would have to kind of give it more prompt context or primary messages to make sure it understands your brand, your ethos, your new product line offering and what you could do. So that's primary content. And I'll, I talked about examples, right? I talked about how could we prime the output of a LLM model to think it in terms of uh, you know, the output that I want. So there are different uh, terminologies, but I'll, I'll try to stick to one. So there is zero shot or there is few shot or one shot. Now zero shot is traditional, right? Zero shot is you ask chat GPT something, it gives you a traditional response on its own. A few shot or a one shot is where you try to prime the output by giving <coughs> it an example. For example, I want to, ex and I'll use the same example of the resume because that's fresh in my mind. I want to extract the school of a particular candidate, right? I don't want to write every time, you know, please only extract this. So what I'll do, I'll put a resume and in the output, I'll prime it to say input resume, output school XYZ. I'll put another example, input resume, output school, you know, ABC. I'm not telling it what I need to do. I'm only priming the output that this is what I want. This is the type of examples I'm satisfied with. Please can you think along the same lines and solve the problem for me. This becomes even more interesting because then you're skipping your prompt engineering. You are, you know what you want as an output and probably you know with time this will get even more advanced to understand the intricacies of what you want that you could not even define in a textual prompt. So this is going to get more interesting in terms of examples. This also helps us leverage our past data. So let's say I have created XYZ job descriptions around a certain competency. Could I in the future, in the same line of thinking, depending on my company requirements, needs, or the you know, stack tech stack that I work on, create a new JD which is tailored and tonality also kind of get, gets addressed with few short or zero short learning. And this is again, in terms of, we talked about examples, this is cues, right? Hints for the LLM model to think in terms of this thing. So if I'm interacting with a chatbot, it is not able to kind of give me the response that I want. Uh, it, it has conversational, obviously, it has conversational mechanics. I could go ahead and guide it to the right answer, right? In terms of what I think, I could reject, accept, or analyze things and, you know, kind of orient it towards the decision I want. So here, here are some examples in terms of providing it cues, making it understand my context better. What if it does not understand that, uh, you know, HP Omen is a gaming laptop, for example. Could I orient it to understand that world better? Could I orient it to understand that, you know, in today's world, 120 hertz is normal, right? That's not something that I would want to put up in my tagline if my product is giving 120 hertz, we need to kind of identify something else. So these are things that we would want to bake in, in our prompts to make sure that the, the outputs are better. Okay, I'll go on to supporting content, it's self-obvious, you could uh, augment it with data that is relevant for the problem that you're trying to solve, and supporting content is definitely going to help. Now, whatever I talked about today could be all done on ChatGPT, you don't need some complicated tech architectures to do this, right? all these intricacies could be baked into one single prompt to solve for the solution. So you could all try this out, you know, all these elements out in ChatGPT and solve any kind of problem that you, you know, want to solve. Okay, now since we've covered the, you know, what, what are the operations that we are doing with ChatGPT, you know, what are the elements that you need to kind of think or have in your mind when you're doing something like this, let's talk about some interesting techniques for prompt engineering, right? We, I think I covered some of them, but specificity, you know, instructions, there are non-chat scenarios. I don't want the robot uh, or the chat GPT to respond every time in a conversational manner. I would want to probably orient it to respond to me uh, in some other manner, for example, uh, as the extractor for a school, right, for example. So you could prime the output, and there is something called the, which I have kind of learned very recently, is there is something called the recency bias. I could have a very complex prompt, right? I could have three pages of a prompt, 
but my message could have got lost in the middle. It helps to repeat the most important or summarize the prompt again. So we are creating a larger prompt. We are also summarizing and emphasizing on the important parameters at the last of the prompt. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so that, that's a separate topic, but yeah, so it has formed an understanding of the human world. If we are biased towards a particular entity and the text that it has ingested will orient it towards being biased to that entity. So there are there's a lot of work going on in terms of explainability, bias removal. There are synthetic data sets that people create. So I'll talk about synthetic data sets as well for a minute because you kind of gave me the segue. Um, in Google's I.O. about four or five years back, they asked a question about uh, create a pitch, uh, you know, sh uh, create a create an image of a doctor, right? And every time they kind of used to run this, there was always a male doctor that got represented because of the bias, right? So what Google did to remove this bias, and again, there are experts who sit and analyze AI systems to determine biases and then solve those biases by providing data sets which are uh, of the opposite nature. So if I augment that AI model with more images of female doctors, the output that I would get would probably not be as biased as my earlier one. So data sets are the reason for bias and to counter bias we need to improve our data sets with synthetic data sets so that we could remove bias. So that's an activity that everybody you know in the AI world does fundamentally or is thinking about. More discussion, uh... I'm not a bias expert, but the one that I know is definitely synthetic data sets or removal of the bias data set. That could be another one that I can think of the top of my mind. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Um, since we can use it to analyze stuff, we could use it to analyze biases, but what is to stop it from being biased to take biases in? And I, I, again, these are things that, that's what, I, uh, what uh, you know, I mentioned in the beginning of the class, it's an art, right? It could do that, it could not do that, but how do we counter that is again, you'll have to define that going yeah, to. And at the end of it, no, because then we will not consider it to be human-like. Because actually humans are biased. Hmm. Okay. And so the, one of the reasons why we actually interact so well with it is because it's also like us. <laughs> so eventually we'll never solve it. <laughs> <laughs> we will only attempt to solve it. Okay. So I think you kind of have a, a glimpse on. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover that. I'll cover that down the line. So I, I have given some examples of the techniques that I taught you. Uh, Jaspreet mentioned that you could orient a chatbot today in, in ChatGPT 3.5 as well. There's something called a system message. Now the system message is a place where you could write things, and the LLM model with every text interaction, even if it's the last message of your whole text interaction, keep that as a primary content. So whatever you write in your 10th conversation script will be appended you know, uh, by a system message that you bake in on, on, on your system. So if you are using ChatGPT and you, you tell it, you are, let's say, I, I, the system message that I would write, for example, for this class today, say, I am Puneet, I am teaching a guest lecture at Ashoka, about prompt engineering, please uh, remind, uh, please highlight whenever I don't use some text book definition, right? So it'll keep analyzing all my interactions, and then at the you know it'll it'll append that with saying that this is something that you are derailing or you are uh, not using the conventional definition of AI at this point of time, just for an example, right? So system message is something that is retained with every conversation that happens with chat GPT. So you should definitely kind of check this out. This is great in terms of solving a lot of problems as well. Okay. Um, you need to now use these elements to start playing with each other, right? I could use a system message. I could use a few short uh, learning example and then try to solve, solve my problem. So 
when you are using these components, you know, all permutation combinations, you'll find the right fit for the problem you are trying to solve. This is an example of a non-chat scenario, and we'll use that today. In terms of, you know, there's a there's a message that comes out, and I wanted to analyze the analyze the sentiment of the message and give a sentiment rating rather than talk to me, right, in a human way. So I could still orient Chat GPT to do this, right? Perform a sentiment analysis and give me a rating rather than a chat conversation. We'll talk about the most interesting chain of thought reasoning. And the, the reason this is becoming so and so important today is because we are able to architect just like a human would solve a problem. Chain of thought reasoning helps us define those, let's say the templates or the steps required to achieve a particular output. A very quick example on this, when chat GPT first released, uh, and it's common knowledge, right? It, it cannot do well on mathematical problems, right? And the reason, the uh, chain of thought came into the picture. People started priming, you know, giving it a step-by-step -step instruction on how to perform, uh, uh, you know, mathematical uh, operations. Or another thing that people used to do was, can you please start highlighting the steps that you're taking to, you know, arrive at this answer? Now, when ChatGPT was oriented to think in terms of defining the steps it used to take to arrive at the final answer, it started, you know, getting better at what it is doing. Why it is doing, why chain of thought reasoning works, I'll, I'll give you my shot at why I think this works. When you break a complex problem down, right, into simplistic parts, into step-by-step -step instructions, your third step could probably resonate better with an understanding of the LLM world because a complex situation to a complex output is something that is, you know, is not possible because it is like magical, right? It cannot understand a lot of intricacies of the problem if I don't orient it to a step-by-step -step approach to I, uh, or I give it more examples, more hints. So that's, that's you know, why chain of thought prompting works. Yeah, I, I just want to add on this because this is, some of the things he's saying are going to become like normal words for us. You know, uh, the few short, one short. Uh, sorry, I'll just take a minute. You know, few short, one short, multi short, zero short, all that stuff today are new words. In three, four years from now, these words will be like, everyone yeah. would be using them. Everyone. They'll be like tag words, search engine optimization, da 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 da, like the way we use that today. And one of those is going to be multi short. Multi chain of thought. Chain of thought. Chain of thought. Than one shot, two shot, huh? <laughs> Chain of thought. And there's very, very interesting, in fact, I don't have that with me right now, but as Puneet said, if you actually ask ChatGPT that a monkey, there are two monkeys, and one of them has three red apples, and one of them has five, and then if you take one, so, so it's your typical equation, if you multiply this by that, multiply 3x plus 5 minus y equals whatever, it always gives the wrong answer. Yes. It's not primed for mathematics or reasoning. You know, it's a creator. But the moment you try and say that, look, okay, what did you do? Okay, what was the first step? And it'll say, you know, first step, three apples were taken from here. Okay, then what? Okay, seven mangoes were put there. And then it immediately arrives at, an, at the right answer because it's going at the chain of thought rather than the final answer itself. And this chain of thought uh, is kind of a massive yeah. uh, secret way to do prompting to help uh, so I'll, I'll kind of stop here and, yeah, yeah you were saying something. Um, this feels a lot like the Socratic model of learning. Mm -hmm. Is that intentional or like... So Socratic model, Socratic right? Model it, 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 I don't know if it's intentional. Mm -hmm. I, I'll talk about, you but know, yes. a, a taxonomy at the end of this yeah. session today. Probably it'll cover that. But I'll get back to you on this one. So, so just like we think, and another trade secret, we, you, if you buy the $20 uh, chat GPT that uh, just be this bought, you'll find something like call, called interpreters, right? What's that magical interpreter? You know, you have one for calculator, one for emails, one for creating diagrams and things like this. What essentially chat GPT is doing? Why can't you do that directly in the interpreter? Why do you need a chat GPT? Chat GPT is breaking down your complex prompt inst into instructions for this interpreter and by using chain of thought reasoning. So chat GPT is first creating a, you know, a reasoning framework and then saying for this framework, if I have a mathematical equation, this can be solved by a calculator. So why don't I pass this mathematical equation to a calculator 
retrieve that result back and utilize that to solve my problem. So that's how the interpreters that are coming today are using chat GPT to create chain of thought solutions and then execute that. So that's something that is getting very, very popular these days as well. Uh, if you've used chat GPT in Microsoft and not the consumer version, there are two things that... Bing, in Bing. In Bing. Bing temperature is there? Okay. So there are two things that stand out. I've been trying to experiment on this a lot. Uh, and again, Microsoft's guideline also tells us that you should either change or understand top P or the temperature. Temperature is easier to understand, so we'll stick to temperature for today's class. Temperature is a, a bind, it, it's not a binary value, it's a value between 0 to 1. I can set it to 0, I can set it to 1. I can set it to 0.1, I can set it to 0.9. Essentially what I'm doing when I'm changing the temperature of the model is, I'm asking it to be more creative or less creative. And I'll tell you the reason again why ChatGPT gives similar responses to different prompts of, of, you know, of people who are trying it on different machines. The temperature is the same, right, for ChatGPT. But if, I, if you utilize Bing, you try to jump the temperature up to 1, for the same kind of question, you'll, the answers you'll get will be crazier. Right? If you really want the creative potential of generative AI or LLMs, you should start you know, changing your temperature value to 1 and then start kind of playing around with Gen AI. So that, that's something that you should keep in mind. If you want it to be factually correct or focus, you're writing an exam answer, right? You don't want it to be more creative. You're writing your assignment, you don't want it to be more creative, you want it to restrict to facts. Then you switch your temperature to 0. So in the hip hop thing, the temperature was closer to 1. Yeah. Wait, so these user augmented word parameters, are they only limited to like Bing's, in, like Bing's use of AI or GPT-4? Yeah. Bing's? So this is a feature. Let's say this is a, you know, the model is the car. This is the lever, right? It's available or not available depending on the implementation. If it's a consumer model for a specific task, probably people don't enable you to set the temperature. I have created a coffee bot for a company. I've not you know, enabled the user to set the temperature, but I have done that behind the scenes, right? Bing probably allows you to set that temperature. So when you are testing or playing with it, you could do that on Bing today. Bing actually just gives you three values <coughs> rather, rather, rather than Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Exactly. Perfect. You could do that with prompt engineering because you are orienting it to think in terms of be more creative. That's the prompt that I would give. So, yeah. So this is actually, actually you're absolutely right. This is this is helping your prompt engineering, which you could have yeah. done it by yeah. writing itself. But they're saying, okay, we'll make it easy for you. Or since you could also override, I have tried that as well. Set my temperature to zero. Ask it to be more creative. Mm -hmm. It does. And again, the, it's very funny and you know, you should experiment this uh, on your own. It tries to be creative, but is still restricted. If I then make temperature one and then ask it to be more creative, then it, then it will take me to Mars. Talk about Mars to me. Yeah. So that's, that's how, you know, these parameters fundamentally change. And the, the reason with such a limited prompt, you get an output, you, you, the only interaction that you're having with this large and powerful model is that English statement that you're writing, right? or you know, Hindi, since it's multilingual. So you have to be more accurate, more prescriptive, more specific. You, know, you need to augment your prompt better to get better responses. You only have that kind of whatever context length you have, right? And you need to use that very wisely as well because you know, for enterprise use, and you know, ChatGPT is $20 a month, but we are being charged per token by Microsoft, right? For every uh, and Google's done, taken a leap ahead, said we do token world is very, very, you know, kind of complicated. We'll charge you per character. So, so per character is what we get charged for both for the input as well as the output. So we, and there is a new field that will emerge probably six months from now, which is prompt optimization. You know, we're spending a lot of money with prompts. How could we optimize that? Could we create a, could we create a, let's say a, system which stores prompts. If I'm asking about where is Ashoka University again and again. Done. Uh, for the activity as well. So we, we'll, we'll wrap it up in five minutes. I, I'll try to cover whatever you know I can in the next five, seven minutes. Okay, so here is a quick glimpse on what you should do, right? You should start 
and again this is an iterative process as i keep saying you can't write the most the perfect prompt in the first shot right you need to iterate to be able to define your prompt better there are solutions now that exist which help you craft that prompt but it takes the magic away you should kind of at the early stage of uh, playing with generative ai try to utilize your intellect to create those prompts so you should start with clear instructions you should add a clear syntax in terms of what you are looking for how you are looking for the structure in which you are looking the you, you know what you are looking for and you have to break the task down if you keep it very very complex it will try to attempt to solve the problem on its own uh, but if you break it down it will be easier for the llm model to break that problem down use affordances you can describe the scenario you are in and make sure that the llm resonates with your world better to be able to answer your question so i can uh, if i'm writing uh, uh, you know a prompt around teaching prompt engineering at ashoka i'll describe at ashoka university you know these are the kind of students that i'm interacting with should i keep it more technical or you know whenever i'm asking chat gpt to create an agenda should i keep it more technical or non non technical these are things that it would understand fundamentally better if i describe the situation i'm in so uh, specify output structure or prime the output with examples and cues and the last one is repeat instructions at the end this is something that i found you know i talked about it earlier as well which is the recency bias so in your prompt the last part of your prompt is given the most weightage is what i've experiment you know understood with my experiments so i try to repeat what's the core of my objective at the end or utilize that as a system message so that it understands across all my conversations okay you can take a photograph of this um uh, it's a quick guide around prompt engineering you need to understand the intricacies of the models you need to understand the bias somebody talked about biases somebody talked about you know i try this i get this kind of output you need to understand the pros and cons of this model right then you'll be able to accelerate your potential and craft beautiful prompts Uh, once you understand you know how does this work right uh okay so again some of these things i've already covered in terms of chain of thought and uh, we'll do one activity today which will help you but this is the last topic that i'll touch upon which is the creativity in hallucinations today enterprises are worried with hallucination and uh, they're saying that when we are using generative ai to search and jaspreet would advise against it he would say please use it to create not search <laughs> but today uh, i am creating systems where i'm using generative ai to search now when i do that the only delta that i get is hallucinations so for for enterprise usage for search usage for some of the factual tasks hallucinations is a problem for the creative world hallucination is not a bug it's a feature right you can use hallucinations to your advantage set the temperature to 1 and create new magic right so it's important right we need to address hallucinations we need to activate the creative part of the hallucination uh, potential of the llm model as well right so i will uh, stop with this i uh, this is the first part we covered today prompt engineering <laughs> 2021 uh, you know it has a data till 2021 but if you are trying to build things or uh, use your data to go forward then you need to learn how to use your personal data you could do that with your um, system messages add contextual messages and then perform the analysis that you want to perform and then using all these skills you could go ahead and build products and right? you don't need a conventional software engineer to write rules english is the most powerful language that you can use th for this So I'll take a pause here. Uh, I have a activity, small activity planned for you. Uh, what we'll do is we'll divide ourselves in two batches again. Uh, we'll do a maker and a checker. Uh, and what we'll do, we'll create a Chat GPT bot that can create a story, an, an emotional story. Somebody talked about that, right? It'll be able to create an emotional story for a marketing brief that Prashant will give. And then this side of the house. or we'll or, you know we'll shuffle bases your interest so this is this will be the creative zone where people will create a marketing story and Let this be the creative one because they got the first oh okay so <laughs> this this team is the creative uh, team that will create uh, the story 
or the structure for the bot to be able to create the story. And the second team, what they will do, they will act as Prashant. They will validate or they'll, they'll be a checker for that story. Before Prashant walks up and sees the final output, can I get a first level review of that script? Basis the parameters that I set. So the parameters that we'll be setting, you know, will be done by this side of the house. The creativity and the, you know, utilizing chat GPT to create the script will be done by this side of the house. You can choose to kind of switch if you are interested in one over the other. Both are equally important today. Writing an email is important. Summarizing it for me and consuming it is also very important. So we'll, we'll start with this activity and we'll wait for a brief from Prashant. I'm going to write it down so that you guys can. Okay. So uh, this is on uh, the gaming brand, right, Oman? So the marketing job to be done is to make the brand more meaningful, right? What does that mean? It means that when asked the question, "Do you love this brand?" A lot more people should say yes. I love this. That's the, let's say that's the marketing objective. Make the brand more meaningful. And there's an attribute here, which is about technically called affinity, but let's just call it brand love. How are you to do this? You are to do this by making the brand stand for progress. And because it's in the context of gaming, it's obviously about progress in gameplay, right? Sufficiently complex brief for creativity, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to make it more complex? No. Questions on the brief? There will always be 100 questions on the brief. Okay, Prashant, will you want to participate with the checker team? The checker for the brief. Checker, master or the checker. So okay. Is checker is this one. Creative is this one. I'll and just please, can you help the creative team? I'll okay. kind of play a dual role in terms of helping all of you. So essentially, what you need to do is we need to write one prompt, right? The maker team. We need to write one prompt which is powerful enough to generate a a 30 second ad script for the objective that was presented, right? And then basis are the, 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 the larger from the system message would be designed and specifics of the ad will be given as a prompt to chat GPT to generate that prompt. There with me? Any questions? So one system message and then obviously we'll get multiple scripts since they will be creating the checker part we'll try to push multiple scripts and see what you know what's the story that we we'll land up with which is the best one. Yeah, can they use chat GPT? Just one laptop is fine. All of you kind of work together. <laughs> if if we can find that, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So one of the team members can come here, discuss uh, that system message and brief. While all of you try your individual prompt engineering skills, the best feature you could kind of say that I found something which is helpful in designing new prompts. So can you include that in system message, and we'll do it in a collaborative way. Yeah, I'll open. We can open my chat GPT. Who wants to be there? You want to be there? Okay, good. You were the first to raise your hand. Come. Okay, so if you can see my screen, both for both of you, there are. I clicked here, and I have not. I renewed my plus uh, right now. So there is something called custom instructions. You click custom instructions, you'll get two boxes. How would you like the chat GPT to respond? And what would you like chat GPT to know about you to provide better responses? So we need to fill this box. We need to fill this box. And we, we need to write one prompt, right? So that prompt could change every time. Fundamentally, we need to align on these two first. And then prompts could be iterative, could be different to create different type of stories. Yeah.